Welcome to the opening event of the Fall Funny People series at the Y. I'm pleased to be back and to kick off the series with a great book, I Only Roast the Ones I Love, Busting Balls Without Burning Bridges, which will be signed after the program by the very talented Jeffrey Ross. In the spirit of roasting, we are here tonight to celebrate the art of the roast, honoring someone by dishonoring them. Jeffrey Ross has been crowned the Roast Master General. He has been called the meanest man in New York and the Mother Teresa of assholes. At the Matt Lauer Roast, he told Aretha Franklin, who sang the national anthem, I've never been to a show where the fat lady sang first. <laughs> and that she never forgets an R-E-C-I-P-E. He, <laughs> he told Abe Vigoda to change his Facebook status to resting in peace, and said, Al Roker claims he's had his stomach stapled to what, a refrigerator? And it was he who said that Hugh Hefner was the first person to mix Viagra and prune juice, so he doesn't know whether he's coming or going. <laughs> Jeffrey Ross has appeared before millions, and he has entertained hundreds of them. He has given the world more laughter than Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie combined. And if this were a larger room, there could have been 100 more seats. No more people, just more seats. <laughs> And now he's written a book where most of his friends wondered whether he's actually ever read a book. We've been close friends for nine years, but he constantly reassures me that it won't last. And in the spirit of that friendship, I am happy to have him on this stage. Let's look at some of his work. Roll tape, please. Thank you. This is a great show. And Sid, what a special treat that they got the same band that played your bar mitzvah. That is Really special, special night. <laughs> really a great. My one regret is that Milton Berle isn't alive to see this. It really is. I'm kidding you, of course. You're my idol, sir. You're a uh, idol, but uh, you know. Uh, no, this is great. And uh, Sid Caesar and Milton Berle and uh, Jonathan Winter. I've seen younger faces on Cash. <laughs> There's a reporter back there from Ready to Die magazine. This is just another great night and a great week. And Sid Caesar, just uh, you bring it to a whole nother level. And it, it really is an honor to, to be able to talk to you like this. And I really appreciate it. When I joined the Friars just a few years ago, it wasn't such a hip place. You know, there was no children allowed in the club, but there was still a diaper changing station in the men's room. <laughs> the secret handshake was like this. First off, Carl Reiner was supposed to be here tonight, but apparently he had some sort of family obligation. <laughs> and your former castmate Sally Struthers couldn't be here, but she did send three bags of grain. <laughs> I've done every single one of these rows. I'm, I, there's nothing left to say. Look at this dais, it's pathetic. <laughs> but at least my new manager's here, Bernie Brillstein. How you doing, Bernie? Wave, wave. That's just when I need a manager who's more famous than me. <laughs> a living legend, everybody. Bernie Brillstein's been in show business so long, he once said to Noah, face it, kid, you're a boat act. <laughs> No, I'm kidding, Bernie. I love you. I think you're great. And uh, this is great. We've been together a month so far. The only thing that's happened is I got you on TV. <laughs> anyway, Rob. Oh, yeah, I'm right here. I know. <laughs> you're a great guy, and a lot of people say you should go into politics someday. As a matter of fact, I predict that within the next 10 years, you could be the next president of the Hair Club for Men. <laughs> and by the way, congratulations on making the cover of Let Yourself Go magazine. <laughs> well, 
like I said, I'm going to keep it short because there's a lot more funny people coming up, and let's face I really it. I hope so. Huh? <laughs> I want to keep it short because I have a lot of friends still coming up, and let's face it, last year's show was more stretched out than Dr. Ruth's pussy. I was... <laughs> Which, by the way, is where they're holding next year's roast. <laughs> they're expecting a bigger crowd. <laughs> Folks, Jerry Stiller has the face of a star, and that star is Lassie. <laughs> His Hebrew name is Yich. <laughs> Sandra Bernhard, holy sh**. <laughs> I wouldn't f Sandra Bernhard with B. Arthur's dick. <laughs> Dr. Ruth is here. How are you again, Dr. Ruth? Where is she? and horny. She went down on me standing up. <laughs> Dr. Ruth is so old, her vagina has mice. <laughs> Janine, how are you, pal? Janine Garofalo. <laughs> Let me give you some career advice, all right, pal? You're allowed to turn things down. <laughs> Just say no. You're a great actress, but you made more bad pictures than Photomat. <laughs> and what was the movie you made with Ben? Mystery Men? That movie was so bad, I fired my agent. <laughs> Gene Siskel was going to review that movie, but he took the easy way out. Ladies and gentlemen, Jeffrey Ross. Well, there's more to come. I haven't seen some of that footage in a long time. Well, wait till you see the rest of the footage. Remember when we had that sleepover? Uh, I just get the feeling this is going to be my last night ever at the Y. <laughs> is Joan Baez going to sing some songs later? Or? You know, I was doing so well without you. <laughs> they were laughing. Okay, let's start. Let's get one question in. All right, for the uninitiated, or for those who think they know and don't really know, what's a roast? What exactly is a roast? Thank you, Thank you for wearing your good moccasins to the show, sir. <laughs> Are you here for the show or for the air conditioning, sir? <laughs> I didn't realize this was a benefit for this guy. <laughs> this guy's sitting there like he's got to go to the bathroom. Are you okay? All right. Sorry, Eddie, I didn't realize. That's okay. Please welcome Mr. <laughs> Jeffrey Ross. This is such a nice room. You know, Thomas Jefferson was bar mitzvahed in this room. <laughs> well, why don't you start off by explaining what, what's a ro what a roast is? They just watched 20 minutes of it. Okay, I'll go to the next question. <laughs> they want to know where they can get a good deal on a pair of shoes. <laughs> How you doing, sir? <laughs> All right, never mind. It's going to be an hour and a half for you folks in one of the longest nights of my Ma life. Put your purse down, relax a little bit. Nobody's going to take it. Come on in, you guys. We have some late people. How you doing? I was worried sick about you, too. <laughs> I love your outfit, sir. The sweater draped over. Very cool. What were you late on the Hampton Jitney getting in? <laughs> I, I don't really think you're grasping the concept of the interview format, but <laughs> a little up. You want me to ask you some questions? Uh, we used to be friends. All right, let me let me start. With, let me try. Let me try this one. Uh, you wrote a great book, 
And and uh, you snuck a biography in there, and I actually got to tell Eric. The book Idle. comes out today, by the way. Today the is thing. the first time that I'm getting to talk about it. We'll, we'll, we'll plug we'll plug it all through. You're Just thanked in the credits at the end. Did you me. notice? Yes, I, I did. Did I spell it right? Yes, you did. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. We have plenty of time. It's, it's getting okay. tougher and tougher to compliment you. All right, but but the truth is, it's very hard to deconstruct comedy, and especially in a funny way. And you managed to pull it off. And you start the book by creating this line of roasts in history. You talk about Marie Pasteur at the roast of De Louis Pasteur in Arbois, France, in 1881, and you say, "Lou, I think maybe you'll appreciate the irony of this, but I'm fucking the milkman." And, <laughs> and it, if you don't get it, you don't belong here. So that's chapter three, the history of the roast. Talk, talk about the book. What did you? Why did you write the book? Because I feel like roasting was a lost art for a long time. You think about roasting. Ten years ago, it was little. You know, it was jousting in Latin, and roasting was something that people had forgotten about. Kind of like. Uh, <laughs> I just, I just edited myself. I didn't want to make a joke about your suit. Thank you. Did you get that at Forever 41? <laughs> <laughs> and slowly, over time, thanks to a lot of funny new people, and thanks to Comedy Central and the Friars Club and uh, fans, it sort of has built up momentum where it's like, it's trendy almost, and people are having their own roasts at their, and you know, somebody's getting a bachelor party, or you see a lot of roasts now. I get tons of mail from people who are doing office roasts on, somebody's retiring or somebody gets a promotion. So I figured a how-to was a way to like move roasting forward because you always hear about roasting as like an old thing, you know? So I felt like roasting could be something that um, like NASCAR and football will be the great next pastime. It's interesting. What did you learn through this process that you didn't know before? We're thinking of roasting Kanye West, by the way. <laughs> This guy loves to rain on people's parades. Did you see him <laughs> do that? Pull the tr trophy out of that little, the microphone out of that girl's hand? I heard that he likes to go to kids' birthday parties and throw the cake on the floor. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you didn't learn anything that you didn't know before. You know, it's very sad. You know, comics, we take a sad subject and we try to make it funny. And it's very, I was a big Patrick Swayze fan. I don't want to, and... I heard that his, uh, his very last words were, why is Kanye West such a jerk? <laughs> All right. Yeah. All right, so you didn't learn anything by writing the book, but you know, <laughs> you were actually very supportive of me when I wrote my, I mean, in, as much as you could be, but um, <laughs> you used to make fun of people who wrote books. You said, uh, when I think of Richard Belzer, I think of homicide, and when I think of Al Franken, I think of suicide. <laughs> And that uh, Al Franken gave me a copy of his latest book, and I'm grateful it gave me something to give my maid's husband for Kwanzaa. And, uh, that wasn't a joke, that was a fact. <laughs> what was the experience like with a pro over, writing over a prolonged period of time without an audience? Because you know, most people think that comedians can't, uh, can't sit still without getting a laugh, and you're certainly disproving that tonight. But uh, what was the book experience like for you? Well, I've always, before I was a comedian, I would, I would always wrote short stories, and I'd written, as a kid, as a high schooler, I'd always wrote and tried to write funny <laughs> stuff. That's how I probably knew I could be a comedian. So it was fun, because you can stay up all night, you can eat Chinese food, gain a few pounds, and anything bad that's ever happened to me in show business isn't necessarily funny or interesting in a comedy club, but when you can put it in the form of a story and then hold it in your hand a year later, it's very gratifying. So, so is it, was it a fun it. experience? It was fun. Almost anything, every, almost everything I wrote got into the book. Um, whenever I started to sound like a complete idiot, my editor, Trish, who may, may or may not be here, she uh, reminded me that the book's about roasting and keep it on that. And in the end, I felt like it was a traditional how-to, but like you said, I was able to work uh, personal angle in that made it uh, more fun to write. Well, there are two early influences that uh, I wanted to talk about. One is you're you're part of a dynasty of kosher caterers from New Jersey, right? And that that helped make you funny, <laughs> and that you were also the second youngest karate black belt in in American history. 
which is kind of interesting. The first one was the kid who played a, he was on Land of the Lost. He was like in a, somebody remembers this, Ch Ch Chaka. More he played fun, Chaka fun on Land fact. of the Lost. Um, I wanted sorry. to ask you, how did you get, a, how did you get. Try to be serious. How it doesn't did you, have to be interesting every time. How did you get appointed the Roast Master General? Because um, the, 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 the host master general, for people who know, was the comedian George Jessel. And he spoke everywhere. And the running joke about Jessel was he would speak at every funeral. And there was one open casted f casket funeral where he walked by and said, hey, I know that guy. So <laughs> how, did, how, did that, uh, how did that come about for you? Um, I think it was just sort of uh, being the person to sort of, you know, roasting when I started doing it in the mid-90s was coming off a bad run. They had... Friars Club had gotten some rough press with Ted Danson wearing blackface at a Whoopi Goldberg roast, which, um, you know, anything goes at these roasts, and Montel Williams had no sense of humor and ran to the newspapers. And the next year, the Friars were like, we need some new blood, we need to invigorate it. And to their credit, um, they called me. I had just performed at a golf tournament uh, that the Friars for... Uh, my buddy Greg Fitzsimmons and, and Elon Gold were two comedians that are still my friends, but back then they used to play poker at the Friars Club. They live in L.A. now, but, uh, and they invited me to play poker. So I go to this place, the Friars Club, with my one good sport jacket, and, and um, I started to see this other world of comedians. I, I, didn't, I didn't even, you know, it was completely new. I didn't even know what a roast was, and I met Buddy Hackett. The elevator door opened, and Buddy got on the elevator, and he said... Uh, I said, Mr. Hackett, you don't know me, but uh, you're my parents' favorite comedian, and, <laughs> and, and it's just such an honor to meet you. And I shook his hand, and he shook my hand, and he looked me in the eye, and he said, you know who hates farts the most? <laughs> I said, no, midgets. <laughs> and he just looked me in the eyes, the elevator door opened, he waddled off, <laughs> and I was like, this place is awesome. And then, and then you've, you've repaid them by, uh, by calling them Catch a Falling Star and among other, <laughs> and other names. Well, talk about the first roast that you, uh, that you did for the Friars. Right. Like, so, like, at this, well, you know, a few months before that, when they first saw me at this golf tournament, I, I didn't know that the roast even existed, but Freddie Roman introduced me, and he just gave me this, you know, he slammed me, and I thought it was awesome. You know, everybody was drunk after a Friars Club golf tournament, and... Uh, I went up and, and he, he, he has this belting voice, you know, he cut through, he commanded their attention. And I said, uh, I guess they call him Freddie Roman because you can hear him in Italy. <laughs> and he got a big laugh and the next thing I know, they called me and said, uh, we're roasting Steven Seagal at the Friars Club roast. You know Steven Seagal. And uh, his new movie, Under Siege 2, Deep Impact. <laughs> it just hit theaters like swine flu. <laughs> Which, by the way, is one thing they can't blame on the Jews, huh? <laughs> and it was a thousand people at this roast, and, and uh, you know, it's too big for the Friars Club, so they have them at the New York Hilton. And, uh, and uh, it's just awesome. Buddy Hackett and Henny Youngman and Irv, you were probably there, weren't you? It was a great night. And, uh, and uh, Milton Berle, you know, this is guy is... The roast guy. I mean, he's done a, you know, by this time I had done some research. This was pre Google, pre YouTube. I had to go to the Museum of Broadcasting. So I checked out the old roasts and I saw, like, anything goes. And I love the idea that you could say mean things about your buddies and raise money for charity. And it was like, it was, it, it was like a concept that I, I just couldn't, it was titillating. And uh, I, I agreed. And I went up there and I, I worked on my jokes for weeks, trying to out on my buddies. And all my friends, the cool comics downtown, they made fun of me. Oh, you're going to go up there and play with the old guys? You know, they thought it was corny. But to me, it was the very essence of alternative comedy. It would be a total mind fuck, you know? Like Milton Berle, here's like, you know, he's got 50 years on me. Uh, this will be a great story. I'll do it once, and I'll say I did it. You know what I mean? Just like jumping out of a plane or whatever. I'm going to do a friar's roast. And uh, I'm very nervous when I get there. It's very intimidating. And... Milton Berle brings me up uh, something to the effect. You remember that? Uh, he's, he's on his way to a, to a convention for lesbians with dildo rash. <laughs> Jeff Ross. 
And I walk up, I shake Milton's hand, and, <laughs> and uh, Milton's sitting right here. You know, I'm at the podium now, and uh, Milton's right here, and Steven Seagal is sitting here completely stone-faced. And I look at Steven Seagal, and I'm, I'm practically quivering at this point. And uh, I look out at the audience. I said, uh, I realize a lot of you don't know me, but I feel uniquely qualified to be here today because I'm also a shitty actor. <laughs> I had a few more good jokes. I had a little bit of a run going, and then all of a sudden, I started feeling a poke in my ribs, like from the Milton side of the podium. And every time I got a big laugh, I got a little pop. And I, you know, the audience is thinking, I don't know what I don't know what to make of it. Am I going long? Am I doing something wrong? And but you know, the audience, it's right there, and I'm in a moment, and it's rolling, and I can't believe it. It's like I did everything but put my hands in the air like I was on a roller coaster, but then boom, boom. And I realize he's trying to trip me up. He's messing with me because I'm doing well. And uh, finally, I got into a thing with him. I was like, what are you doing? Milton Burrow? why do you, I, I, I saw, I was in an antique store today. I saw, uh, I saw Milton Burrow. 800 bucks. <laughs> I just made up anything I could think of to hold my own. And uh, finally, Buddy Hackett, who I'd only met on that elevator a short before that, uh, he was down the end of the dais. And he said, hey, Milton, let the kid work. Remember when you used to? <laughs> and Milton, on cue, ran down the edge of the dais and kissed Buddy. And I said, how about a hand for those two, between the two of them, over 80 years of homosexual experience? <laughs> <laughs> it was all timing. It had nothing to do with the jokes or what we were saying. It was the fact that I wasn't, like, crying or buckling or caving. And, uh, and then Milton came running back down, and he gave me a big hug and a kiss. And uh, it was really cool. Afterwards, we went back to the uh, Friars Club and... Uh, you know, I, you know, I got to talk to Buddy Hackett a little bit, and he said whenever somebody's doing really well, that's what Milton does to them. You know, he's done that to anybody who's funny, so you should take that as a compliment. And it got me enough confidence to walk over to Milton, and he said, oh, you know, you were funny, and this and that. And he said, he always loved to give unsolicited advice. And he said, uh, he said, uh, he said, you were funny, but let me tell you, uh, do less jokes. They only remember the home runs. And that's something that I took with me, with me into the book and into the, all the roasts that I do. And, you know, it's almost anything in life. You know, you, you know sometimes less is more in show business, you know. Uh, so they only remember the home runs. That was Milton's thing. He was uh, a very big influence. And his last roast, my first roast, interestingly enough, was his last. Well, it's a great. And we'll, we'll show a little bit of Milton uh, later on in the program. But what's interesting is that that moved you the next roast. And you, you were on the roast map when Comedy Central started putting these roasts on television. And the B. Arthur joke, when we, when we uh, I want you to tell that story, you know, the I wouldn't fuck her with B. Arthur's dick became, <laughs> became and that was also right before, right about when the internet started. That, the, the sizzle on that joke lasted months. Tell the, tell the story about the, the, uh, the, the lead in, it was, to the, it was the Jerry Stiller roast. Uh, by, by now, this is a few years later, um, I had somehow talked Comedy Central and the Friars Club into joining up and trying to give some exposure to what I considered to be something that I was only doing for the boys at the Friars and their friends, you know? So uh, we got a little momentum. We did Drew Carey, we did Rob Ryan, but we did Jerry Stiller, who took it as, I mean, he was very uh, flattered by it. He was extremely honored. and. He called up his friends and he invited his friends and one of the friends that he invited to come and just sit there and be on the dais as his invited guest was happened to be the funniest lady in the world, B. Arthur. So the idea of not including her in the show did not, I, having her be there, but it was just irresistible. It was, it was almost torture. You're going to take the funniest person in the world, let alone the room, and not address it, but yet she's on the dais. So according to my... Uh, museum of Broadcasting Research, she's fair game. But it's like you got to have the right joke. You can't just pick on B. Arthur. She's not part of the show. You have to really, you know, it's like go big or go home kind of thing. And luckily, right before I went on, Sandra Bernhardt, who uh, can be very funny um, at home maybe, but not in public... <laughs> 
she sang a song to Jerry Stiller. Uh, do you remember what it was? No. I she don't sang know. a Magic Man. Can't remember. She sang like a sexy song and basically gave him a lap dance. And if you know Jerry Stiller at all, he. He, 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 he winces at dirty words, and he gets very embarrassed very easily, and he's very sort of good-natured like that. And uh, obviously his wife, Ann Mira, is right down, <laughs> sitting just a few seats away. And here's Sandra Bernhardt sticking her booty in his face, and it was very uncomfortable, very Friars-like and uh, um, uncomfortable. And I was next. <laughs> and I had this joke in my margin. I said, this is a B. Arthur joke, but I probably can't get away with it. But you never know. Sometimes I, I don't just do zingers. I try to draw people out. You try to bring people into the game a little bit. And uh, I did a few jokes. I got a warm up. You saw some of the jokes about Dr. Ruth and Janine Garofalo. And then I keep looking back at B. Arthur, and I'm taking my time. And finally, I, I look down at Sandra Bernhard, and I see her sneaking off. She's not staying for the rest of the show. So I go. I got to do it this now or never. So as she's walking off, I go, Sandra Bernhardt, holy shit. I wouldn't fuck you with B. Arthur's dick. <laughs> and B. Arthur, as you saw, the joke's like, oh, whatever. But her reaction shot is what made it a home run. Yeah. I mean, her, she had the ability to take this like goofy joke that didn't really mean much and make it like this shot heard around the world. And um, like you said, it got everywhere. It was on, you know, the timeouts New York's like funniest moments of the year and stuff like that and I started hearing about B. Arthur, B. Arthur's dick all the time wherever I went. <laughs> College students were always stop B. Arthur's dick. They didn't know my name, but B. Arthur's dick. They knew I was that guy who did that to B. Arthur or with that or whatever. It was just this weird uh, you know, what would you call that? Just a moment in time, a a flash, you know, but people remembered it. And you know, uh, she she uh she, she didn't go to the after party after the, I never saw her again. Um, I didn't know, you know, what, I figured if I'm hearing about it, somebody must say something to her once in a something. I mean, she's making me famous. So almost two years goes by and it's like, I'm hearing people, somebody gave me a dildo with B. Arthur's dick once. You know, my fans, I'm starting to like, this is like my only thing and it's, very peculiar. So I see that B. Arthur is doing a show, um, a traveling, you know, one-person show where she sings uh, show tunes that she did on Broadway over her career, and she sang Mame and, and Fiddler on the Roof, and I looked it up, and I got myself a ticket. It was very expensive. It was a benefit in Beverly Hills, and I went to see this incredible show. She was just her and a piano player, and she, she was not only hilarious, but she looked great, and she worked the room like a, I mean, it, it was very, very memorable show. And afterwards, it was a long line of people waiting to shake her hand afterwards. And I brought flowers. And uh, I waited, I waited, I got last on line on purpose because I didn't want to be, I wanted time to think. And I didn't want to rush it at the end. I wanted to be the last person she spoke to. And I said, uh, I said, that was, I said, I gave her the flowers and she took him and she looked at me and I said, Miss Arthur, I, I don't know if you remember me, but we met at Jerry Stiller's and she went, you nailed me, you prick. <laughs> <laughs> so she had a very good sense of humor about it. And uh, she was, couldn't have been nicer. And I got to take a picture with her. And it's in the book. And it's a, you know, one of those things that you, know, you, can't, you can't believe you're playing with the uh, heavy hitters sometimes at these roasts. You know, it's, it's like the World Series of comedy. It's super exciting when you're doing it. Yeah, I've actually, I, I, I think of it as the Super Bowl of comedy because it only comes once a year. And you've got the people who you make fun of, like Abe Vigoda. I think of it as the ex-girlfriend of comedy <laughs> because it only comes once a year. There. <laughs> I don't plan on winning. I just plan on passing the ball. But Abe Vigoda, uh, at, at, the, um, at the U Hefner roast, you said it's Playboy Abe, not Play Dead. <laughs> But you had, you had one experience where someone actually got mad at you in the Rob Reiner roast. Uh, well, you know, at this point, I'd only been doing the roast a couple of years, and I didn't know all the parameters, and I'm still sort of learning. And it's always better when you make fun of people to their face. You know, Buddy Hackett, he would always never do prank shows. He was never into phony phone calls. He said, 
you know, you don't want to sneak around behind people's back. You, the roasts are fun because you have volunteers and, you, you know, somebody shows up and you can make fun of them. They're, they're up for it. But, like, I was roasting Rob Reiner and he had been married to Penny Marshall. And uh, I said, and, but she wasn't at the roast. But I said to Rob Reiner, I don't even know how to roast you. How do you embarrass a guy who married Penny Marshall? <laughs> What was your wedding song? How much is that doggy in the window? Oh, give me a fucking break. Oh, f feign disapproval over the Penny Marshall joke. B. Arthur would strap one on and fucked me. That's fine, but Penny Marshall. And I was at another roast a few weeks later and uh, in Las Vegas for the owners of the Palm Castino, the Maloof brothers, and there's... Penny Marshall in the front row. And uh, she's definitely having a great time. And then suddenly they introduce me. <laughs> and she just starts standing up and shouting me down like, uh, like Wilson at the president, or whatever his name is. <laughs> What's his name? Yeah. Wilson. Wilson. Yeah, what was that about? How do you heckle the president? <laughs> Are they gonna serve mozzarella sticks at the State of the Union? <laughs> I didn't realize there was a comedy cellar down there. <laughs> and Penny Marshall she started yelling at me. She, did, she didn't come up on stage and do it, but she started yelling at me, like, you know, just crazy, you know, like, you know, don't listen to him. Don't be nice to him. She's complete, and her friend's trying to pull her down. I don't know what's going on with her, but, and uh, she starts coming towards me. So now I'm thinking, thank God I know a little Taekwondo. <laughs> And she gets closer, and the audience like sees her like shouting me down, you know, protesting my appearance essentially. And I said, uh, "I'm sorry, ma'am. Who were you again, Lenny or Squiggy?" <laughs> and the place, you know, obviously all the Laverne and Shirley fans burst into applause. And I don't know what she did. She was sort of like stuck in the middle. And eventually, I think like somebody pulled her back into her seat. And uh, I was uninvited to the after party. <laughs> Occasionally, a roast master needs to get out of Dodge. <laughs> well, I want to set up the next clip set. And we've got segments from the Pamela Anderson roast and Clips. the William Shapter roast. I'm right here. <laughs> You'll get a kick out of it. You'll enjoy it. All right. You'll enjoy it. Roll tape, please. You know, I want what's a nice uh, way to ask the question, are there any lines that you won't cross? And let me, let me give you a little more context here. You told you Hefner that the friars had considered roasting Larry Flint, but nobody wanted to build a ramp. You said that uh, Hef has fondled more playmates than Michael Jackson. You told Matt Lauer that his interview style is flatter than Martha Stewart's souffle, which serves three to five, just like Martha Stewart. And, you also said that Donald Trump's hair looks like a raccoon's pussy and that it growled at you. <laughs> so is there, are there, I mean, I wanted to frame this in terms of how has your style evolved over time and, uh, and are there any lines that you won't cross or what's your criteria? It's interesting because it's gone, it, it's evolved with different outlets. Like the Friars Club is no holds barred, you know, the first roasts were very dirty. Milton Berle would use the most obscene language that you can't even imagine people even using today. He would use, you know, he would shock people, but they, the friars were so used to it that it wasn't shocking, it was funny. And then, you know, when Comedy Central took it, it, it felt traditional for Comedy Central, but over time, um, I feel like it's gone somewhere closer to like roller derby or something where it, it's, there's almost, it's almost as dirty as it can be and there's no place left to go with it. You know, it, it's like almost like extreme roasting or something, which is really fun and more in line with what you see like on South Park and like Comedy Central's The Chappelle Show, the most popular shows. And that's why the roasts do so well on TV. And then it becomes like a different sort of challenge. And you know, I did a roast on Dancing with the Stars on the finale, which is a family-friendly show, but yet still the roast was killed. It's all about finding the audience, whatever, whoever you're roasting, whatever you're roasting. At this point, I've roasted the Chicago WGN morning crew at 7 o'clock in the morning, and that can go well. It's all sort of 
what I just think of as special material, you know, is it appropriate? You know, the roasts aren't about the friars, or they are, but, you know, Dean Martin or any, or me or Comedy Central or any one thing, what I love about it is that roasting is sort of opened up and, you know, the roast goes places. It's not like you have to go to the Friars Club or you have to watch Comedy Central. Like, I'll roast a guy for his, you know, at a huge corporate event, they'll have me come roast some big shot, and that'll have its own sort of, not line, I guess line would be the right word, but you always want to cross it just a little bit. The last thing you want is people to go, ah, they went easy on them. You know, you want to be, you want, you want someone to be, ro when I roasted Warren Sapp, he's this huge hulking football player uh, who came on Dancing with the Stars with me, and you know, I came in 13th place out of 12 contestants, you know. <laughs> When you come in last, it gives you a certain license to kill. And they had me come on the finale of the dancing show and roast the finalists. I said, and you know, nobody knew who these people even were. It was like an Olympic gold medalist and a, you know, a reality star. I said, I didn't know the show was called Dancing with the Vaguely Familiar. <laughs> I said, I Googled you people. It said, uh, ask Yahoo. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, people are watching that with, you know, their children. It's Dancing with the Stars. It's on at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock on ABC. And I did, I've now done that a couple of times. Like they had me back on the next season, which wasn't even my season because it was so fun. And to their credit, that's a reality show that um, has a sense of humor about itself. And not all reality shows would have the guts to do that. So, um, I, like, I feel like the roast is now something that's transportable and, you know, clean, dirty. It almost doesn't matter. As long as it's funny, uh, people seem to get a real kick out of it. But you, I mean, saying all that, you have a particularly unique and good style. I mean, I, I watch all the roasts, and I've seen Larry the Cable Guy, when you got on, said, that's how you do a roast. And just uh, a short while ago, the Joan Rivers roast, and she was hysterical over your set. She was actually commenting on your style. So... I've seen you agonize preparing over roasts. When do you know that you have a good set? When do you know you're ready to get up there and, 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 uh, and, and skewer? Uh, that's just it. I, I tend to throw myself into it, and it's whatever is right up until the second I'm introduced. So I'm never ready. I just have this deadline. It's almost like uh, you know a newspaper uh, journalist or something. When do you get the story, and when's your deadline? You know, if I find out I'm going to roast Joan Rivers in two months, it, I'm obsessed with it for two months. If the, you know, one time they asked me to roast the head of NBC, Jeff Zucker, on a day's notice, and I did it in a day. You know, probably wasn't as good as when you have two months, but I work right up until the second I'm introduced. You know, if I have my druthers, I have at least two weeks to properly zero in. I hang up pictures of the person around my house to become uniquely familiar with how unattractive they are and <laughs> you know I, I look up their stuff you know essentially I only roast people I'm either friends with or a fan of so it makes it a lot easier you know when I roasted Joan Rivers I went back and I read her memoir and I watched old clips of her on uh, when you know subbing for Johnny Carson and and I watched hours and hours of her jewelry stuff on no I didn't <laughs> <laughs> so you know you uh, you You're know wearing I, some of it now I was always more of a fan of, of comedy and, and popular culture. So when they say, you're going to roast the guy from Star Trek, this was honestly my favorite show as a kid. So it's like a kid in a candy store. I roasted Gene Simmons, who's from the band Kiss. And, uh, you know, this is a guy whose face I had plastered all over my wall as a young kid. And then you meet him in p person, and he, he's just awful. So... I said, Gene Simmons is such an asshole that his own asshole changed its name to Murray. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, when I roasted Flavor Flav, I don't know if we're going to see that or what, but, but uh, I, you know, this is a guy who, when I was growing up, he was in a rap band called Public Enemy. I didn't know about his silly reality show. I just knew that, you know, when my buddies used to drive around New Jersey in our Firebirds, we would listen to Flavor Flav and Public Enemy. So getting to 20 years later to, like, share a stage with these guys is just, it's mind-blowing, really fun. Yeah, but you, you don't, I mean, you don't care all that much because you took a shot at uh, Suge Knight once on Jimmy Kimmel, and then the, I was with you a couple of weeks later in L.A. on a Saturday night, and you said, oh, there's Suge Knight, be careful, he may shoot us. 
and you were serious. And I was just another night out with Jeff Ross. But it was also interesting is when you have this set, depending on where you go in the lineup, someone else may steal your joke. I mean, the older guys used to talk about putting all their jokes on index cards, and they'd throw their index cards away as their jokes were used right. during the lineup. And actually, you would, um, was it the Matt Lauer roast? Actually, it was one of, um, one of the jokes. Uh, it was Al Roker was the uh, roast master, and you said that uh, Al Roker was not uh, Barack Obama's favorite weatherman. It was Bill Ayers. And, and uh, someone, Katie Couric had used that joke before, and you had to cut it, you had to cut it out of your, uh, cut it out of your set. I'm going to put that in my next book, <laughs> entitled what, Shit Nobody Cares About. <laughs> <laughs> I um, love Yeti, you know I'm only but your balls. Yeah, yeah, you say that now. But, you know, you were also great on To Catch a Predator, by the way. That was <laughs> one of the most best episodes I ever had of that show. Um, what's also interesting... Uh, take your time. I'll take my time. Hyperventilating a little bit. Your move, Kasparov. <laughs> that was a chess joke. For the, um, I wanted to talk about the Jerry Lewis roast because that was kind of a very special roast and he was actually judging people as they were coming up and doing their sets. It was like almost performing for a king. How do you mean judging? I didn't pick up on that. Well, if he, was, if he liked the set, he was laughing and animated and if he didn't like the comedian's set, he, was making, he make, made believe he was falling asleep. Uh, so he was, you know, Jerry Lewis was one of those things where I was really busy, I was in Los Angeles and um, I hadn't missed you know, I hadn't missed a Friars roast in a while. And I was just like, you know what, I just can't get back. Because I, I can't just show up and roast Jerry Lewis. I need a lot of preparation. And I was working, I had a full-time writing job at the time on a TV show, and I, I, I didn't know what to do. So um, I said, I can't make it. I'm sorry. And talked to John Pierre at the Friars Club. And, you know, it's always hard to say no because the roasts are so fun. But I thought I would give myself a break. And I figured Jerry Lewis are going to get tons of great people. And I've done 10 in a row. I'm going to lay low. And uh, about two weeks goes by, and Richard Belzer calls me up. And he's like, who the fuck do you think you are? When are you going to get to roast somebody like Jerry Lewis again? This is the greatest comedy hero, a legend. You have to come out and do this. So it was like, no problem, man. So. He, you know, he, he, he really, you know, set me straight. I was definitely, you know, misguided because, like, these are, like, once-in-a-lifetime events, and it's such a thrill because Jerry Lewis is, like, old school, and then, you know, you get to go up, and if you get hidden to laugh, it's huge. And he was a great sport. I said, Jerry Lewis is big in France. Then again, the French don't even know when they stink. <laughs> And they, they said something, you know, sometimes the, the, the producer, the, the Mark Krantz said, you know, um, you know, Jerry's obviously, he called all the roasters, he said, Jerry's obviously very sensitive about Jerry's kids, and, you know, maybe you want to stay away from that, and then instantly that becomes... <laughs> a challenge to do a joke that doesn't piss him off. To me, that's the high mark. If you gotta keep Jerry Lewis laughing and almost tease the subject without going there, because you can't go there without the greatest joke ever, and if it's the greatest joke ever, Jerry Lewis is gonna have to laugh, because he's, he's, he's gotta be a good sport. So I said, uh, I said, people been making fun of you, Jerry, but you know, uh, I love you, Jerry, I think, you don't get enough credit. I said, what about the good things that Jerry Lewis does? You know, What about the fact that just this past Labor Day, a six-year-old kid got up out of his wheelchair and walked for the first time to turn off the Jerry Lewis telethon? <laughs> and, he, and he loved that joke. Jerry loved that joke. Yeah, I mean, I have a shot of him in the book um, of him laughing really hard, covering his face, and next to him is Martin Scorsese and Robert De Niro who are just losing their shit. It's such a great picture because, you know, 
there's his co-stars from that great movie, The King of Comedy, and there I am, a comedian, trying to make them laugh, and Jerry Lewis had a heart attack the next day on the flight home. Yeah. So the rule in the book is never roast anybody over 82. <laughs> Luckily, he was okay, and back to host another telethon, which, by the way, was incredibly entertaining this year. Yes, it was. Um, what's interesting, I wanted to set up another clip. Speaking of all the, uh, the old timers, I called it uh, Past Masters Volume 1. I have uh, segments with Buddy Hackett, Henny Youngman, Milton Berle, and Red Buttons, and uh, wow. they, uh, they practically perfect it. And I don't think we could talk about the roast without, uh, without showing a clip of some of these guys. So why don't we, uh, why don't we roll tape? Norm, you were good tonight. Let that be the start of something. <laughs> Rich, thanks for not doing Sydney Greenstreet. It would have ruined my whole presentation. <laughs> so I guess I know Milton as long as anybody, maybe longer. I was a GI. I met Milton during World War II at the State Door Canteen. The words he spoke to me kept me through my entire career. I never forgot him. He said, you look lonely, soldier. Would you like to dance? <laughs> <laughs> he, uh, he wasn't the best looking woman in the room. But if you know Milton, he had the nicest dress. <laughs> Guy walks into a doctor, he says, Doc, it hurts when I do this. He says, don't do that. <laughs> I think he's brilliant. I think he's at the wrong affair. <laughs> I'm not too normal. Leave me alone. <laughs> man walks into a doctor's office and says, you're going to live to be 60. He says, I am 60. He says, what'd I tell you? Because <laughs> uh, everyone knows Milton Berle is married. But what about my marriage? <laughs> People say, how does it last so long? Here's a secret. My wife and I go to a romantic restaurant twice a week. A little candlelight, a little wine. She goes, Tuesdays, I go Friday. <laughs> I go Wednesdays. <laughs> Before I go any further, I want to say I have an announcement to make. Henny Youngman wants to be remembered. <laughs> By anyone. It is indeed a great pleasure, though, ladies and gentlemen. Great thrill to honor this very dear friend of mine, this <clears throat> Jewish Hunts Hall. <laughs> this Federico Fellini for five-year-olds. <laughs> this is the only man who ever got a Dear John letter from Typhoid Mary. <laughs> and you know it's hard to believe that I know Jerry Lewis over 25 years. I was just a little boy then, and who would have thought that I'd be here tonight honoring him? Show business so strange. Like I was saying to the doorman here tonight, Richard Zanuck, I said, uh, <laughs> but this man, Jerry Lewis, is an actor, a director, a producer, an umbrella, a lampshade, <laughs> a table, a shoe tree, <laughs> and a genuine pain in the rump. This, uh, I'm clowning, Jerry, because I love you. And I want to say this, ladies and gentlemen, a lot of people... Don, yes, you, you, I know. You're not ready to go on because you're not sweating yet. <laughs> a lot of people fought to be on this dais tonight, and those who won aren't here. <laughs> Why a dinner for Milton Berg? Why for Milton Berg? Some of the greatest people in the history of the world, never got a dinner. Tonight, a dinner for Milton Berg. Ponce de Leon. 
The first man to go to Florida without his wife. <laughs> Never got it in. Uh, Sal Schwartz. Who? You don't know him. <laughs> He's a private in the Continental Army. <laughs> Sal Schwartz, who said to George Washington, how come everybody goes to Miami for the winter? We gotta go to Trenton. <laughs> For our people, we must be represented. <laughs> Mahatma Gandhi's mother, who once said to Mahatma, eat a cookie, who's gonna know? Yeah. And You know, it was interesting. Red, red Buttons didn't have a standard roast style. He'd come up with the never got a dinner routine, and it got laughs every time. And he was a, he was a sweet man. And he, I, w I was with you once when he uh, had this uh, um, Clemenza moment in The Godfather. We're all proud of you. We're watching your career. And um, what strikes me about the roasts is that it's like a party that you're invited to. Everybody has a great time, and you kind of key off the relationship that the people have on stage. And it seems like that's still a, a through line. It still, it still goes on. But um, you grew up professionally with Sarah Silverman and Dave Chappelle, but you're a bridge. You were also mentored by these, uh, by, by Buddy Hackett and Milton Berle and Red Buttons. And you're a bridge between those two generations. And, and how are they similar, those generations similar and different as comedians? And, and what did you take from them, the older guys, and what did you leave behind? And what did you learn from them? You know, for me, people always say you're old school or whatever, but, you know, I still work colleges and every other gig that other comedians my age would always work. So to me, it wasn't old school, it was just. The, the delivery could be old school, but the jokes are relevant. And, you know, I feel like you see a little bit of all these, you know, generals in the corporals that are coming up. So, yeah, I feel like it just continues. I don't feel like it's old and new anymore. I feel like comedians are ageless. You know, uh, you know I know you talk to Sid Caesar all the time, and he's as funny now as, as he was when he's, you know, I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't leave you, you know. When you're, my nephew is nine and he's hilarious. So you kind of know, and I stop seeing age with a lot of these people. I look at Dave Chappelle, I look in his eyes, and you can see the same kind of person that Buddy Hackett was. I, I agree with that. There's a kind of timelessness. And the first time I met Buddy, I, I was nervous like you. I walked up, I introduced myself, I said, I'm a writer. He said, I know who you are. I said, I don't like books, and I don't like guys who write books. Now shut up and get in the fucking picture. And, <laughs> And he was, he had the greatest tradition. I thought writing a book I would get respect. I went to the Barnes and Nobles near my house today, right? And I, I look at the new, new nonfiction. I'm so excited. First day the book went on sale. I've been going to bookstores since I can read, and now here's my book. And I don't see it, and I'm so like looking, and I, I don't see it. And then I go, do you have the Jeff Ross book? I only wrote the ones I love. And the guy looks at me, and he's... And he goes around to the other side of the new nonfiction. He pulls away a whole like stand of Curious George DVDs. <laughs> like, and he pulls one out and he hands it to me. <laughs> I go, oh, all right, well, how are people going to find these? And he says, well, if you sign them, there's 12 of them. If you sign them, I'll put them in the front window with a little sticker saying you signed them. Fantastic. <laughs> so I sign each of the books, you know, like whatever, a uh, heart and my name, and I sign them all in a big stack there, and, uh, you know, I see them, like, start moving them into the window, and uh, my friend, Lisa Lampanelli, wrote a book that came out today, so I, I bought her book, which was, you know, also went on sale today, so I go to the register, I pay for the book, and the lady said, I give her my credit card, and the lady says, do you have any ID? <laughs> I said, I just signed a dozen books. She goes, yeah, but the name on the back of your credit card is all rubbed out. <laughs> <laughs> Whatever. Rodney, no respect. Total no respect. Hey. 
So I wanted to just talk a little bit more about the, uh, the elder. They were masters at this forum, and they loved it. I mean, Milton Berle, most people didn't realize how funny he was as a, as a master insult comic. And if you didn't laugh hard enough at the joke, he'd start yelling, he would start yelling at the audience. But he was, he was terrific as a roaster. He, told, he said, it's great that you came out of retirement. It's too bad your voice didn't come with you. I mean, he just had this, he had this amazing technique. But Buddy, who was your mentor, had this great tradition. If he heard a joke, he would call up his five closest friends, tell them the joke, and hang up. And the way I found out about it is I was actually sitting with Sid Caesar, and he picks up the phone, says hello, 20 seconds go by, he hangs up and he's laughing. And from my perspective, it was weird. So I said, what was that? He said, oh, that was Buddy. Roseanne, Rosie O'Donnell, and B. Arthur are gonna be in a new series in the fall. It's gonna be called The Unfuckables. <laughs> and, and yeah, so wait, wait, I wait, wait. So, to Buddy. so I, 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 I go back to my hotel. I can't wait, first person I call is you. And I said, Buddy just told Sid this great, and you're like, that's my joke. So <laughs> it just, uh, they, had, uh, they had total respect for the, uh, for the jokes and the, uh, Buddy gave office. me one of my best roast jokes ever. Um, I was roasting you know, that Janine Garofalo was sitting there and with Ben Stiller in their movie. They had just made a movie called Mystery Men. Um, and I said, uh, I said, uh, I was on the phone with Buddy the night before and we just wrote it together basically. And the joke, uh, Gene Siskel had just passed away and I said, oh, that's rough, I don't know. And he said, no, I'll try it. It's just right, just the touch. And the joke was, oh, Janine and Ben, I saw your movie Mystery Men. Gene Siskel was going to review that movie, but he took the easy way out. <laughs> but it's a great, it's really a great honor to be roasted. I mean, to be the subject of the roast. Although Johnny Carson, who we saw in one of the clips, he once, his closing remark was when he got honored, he said, I'm going to remember this night for, until I get to the parking lot. I mean, but it was still very, it was still very emotional. But is there... Um, I drove to Joan Rivers a few weeks ago. Did anybody see that? Hmm. That was tricky. I never roasted a dead person before. <laughs> if you Google her, you can find her on Craig's and Schindler's list. <laughs> I was going to write a poem to her, but I couldn't think of anything that rhymes with decrepit. <laughs> Are we still talking about roasting? We're still talking about, well, actually, yeah, and I wanted to take it to, to another level because you had, you've done one of the most impressive things that any entertainer can do. You've entertained troops and you've gone over to Iraq. And I wanted to tie roasting the troops into this, into this program and entertaining the troops. Please, give it up. They, give it up for the troops. Um, and uh, I wanted to show, our, our last segment is a, uh, is a clip from the movie Patriot Act which is uh, Jeff's award-winning documentary, and we'll talk about the troops after we see the segment. Roll tape, please. Get on, the job. To get on the same day United Nations officials were evacuating, we were heading in. Uh, flight time for the entire half. Uh, so we can offer airplane, we recommend the use. While we're going to Baghdad, we may do some evasive maneuvers, especially if they're it. So if we like to beg too hard, don't be surprised. If you hear a little popping noise, that's probably the clear it's going out. Yeah. Don't worry about that. Uh, as you can see, we're about to take off into uh, hostile territory. Are you nervous, Chief? No. Are you excited? Yes. Yes! We're in the good hands of the U.S. Air Force. I haven't slept at all, but I am very, very excited. Comedians are kind of comic reporters. The way it looks, the way it smells, and what's going on. It's a, it's a rush. I wasn't going to Iraq to make a movie. In fact, I barely knew how to work the camera. But when I heard the landing gear drop on our C-130, it finally dawned on me that I'd be seeing stuff few civilians get to see, and I became determined to shoot everything in my path. To avoid possible enemy fire, we made a tactical landing, which means swervy and nauseating. Where are we in? Bob Hope Dining facility. facility. Keep hope alive. I remember reading that the Viet Cong once tried to kill Bob Hope at his hotel in Saigon. Bob Hope never got nervous. He was amazing. He was just the coolest guy ever. Did he uh, prepare in any special way as opposed to a regular show? 
Well, you know what you do with the U.S. So you show you try to make the, the material very specific to the place. I mean, there's your act, the stuff you know you're going to do, and then there's some references you throw in that are local and that everybody recognizes, and so they're they're that much more welcome. Have you ever played before 10,000 people? I don't think so. What if they walk out? Please welcome Mr. Jeff Ross. Jeff Ross, everybody. Can I make fun of uh, the general, whoever br you whoever's to, in charge? You have to make fun of everybody that's in charge. If you, if you don't knock the officers, they'll put you on the next plane. Oh, my God. How are you, general? Good to see you back in men's clothes. kicking ass, but I'm worried. I don't think we're ever going to find Saddam Hussein, man. I think we gave him too big a head start. I mean, we were like the cable company. George Bush was like, all right, Saddam, we're going to be there sometime on Tuesday between 9 and 4. One, 1,000. Marco. I miss her sometimes. I ran into my old girlfriend yesterday. Then I backed up and ran into her again. I miss her sometimes. You know, having sex, you have to talk about safe sex, disease. Wouldn't it be great to think about this? If our bodies were designed, so instead of bad things, good things could be transmitted through sex? Like skills? Girl, I'm gonna fuck you till you're an architect. How was your date last night? You got lucky? Yeah, I think my resume speaks for itself. <laughs> Honey, I told you to wait in the Humvee. What the fuck are you doing? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I wanted to talk about entertain the troops because you've been doing it for years and you've been, you, you make the time to do it. How is an audience of soldiers different from a regular audience? I mean, other than the guns and the heavy artillery. Uh, first, I want to point out Larry Gobart is in that clip. Yeah. La Larry, is a Larry, Larry passed away on Friday. I, I started cutting the clips last week and Larry was a good friend to both of us. He uh, was Besides writing M.A.S.H. and all these amazing movies and plays and being one of the most prolific humorists in the country, his training ground was writing gags, one-liners for Bob Hope. So when I got the call to go uh, to Iraq with Drew Carey, by the way, the troops love Drew Carey because, you know, they love blondes with big boobs. <laughs> and I was nervous. I, I asked myself the same question that Eddie just asked. This is how are the soldier crowds going to be? I didn't know anything in, about what to expect. Are they going to be, uh, I don't know. Are they gonna be, it, was, it was a little bit scary because the only thing I'd really seen was, you know, Apocalypse Now and the helicopter of Playmates lands in Vietnam. And I'm like, well, I'm not going to get laughs in that situation. So I went and saw Larry and... Um, he, he sort of filled me in on this concept of foxhole humor. And uh, later on, I adapted my own style. He said, make fun of the commanding officer. You know, that, that'll, he knew that I could do that. And that would get the audience, the soldiers on my side. So whatever else is going on, before you get to that, go after that. And in the book, and later on, I, I, I coined the phrase vicarious insubordination, which essentially is soldier roasting, you know. Uh, going after the guy with the most stars on, and you can't miss. So Larry sort of walked me through, uh, you know, these certain sort of secrets of the trade that he learned while he was in Korea with Bob Hope, and I couldn't believe I was fortunate enough to getting advice from, you know, somebody who'd been there. 
and uh, he was kind enough to let me videotape it. I had a $600 Sony Handycam, and uh, essentially was shooting like a tourist. And uh, about, ha about, you know, as we were landing in Baghdad, you saw some of the footage. I realized that I was seeing things that would be very difficult to explain. And uh, the soldiers were opening up to me in a very candid way because this is the summer of 2003. No one had seen what Iraq really looked like, and the occupation was very new, and nobody knew if Saddam was dead or alive, and uh, there was so much ripe comedy there that almost anything was going to work. If you're wearing a combat, if you're wearing a helmet and a vest, and you know a comedian is 10 feet away, and you know you're could be coming from a, I mean, God knows, you know, they're walking in with all sorts of recent history. It's like the old corny thing. Comedy is tragedy plus time. But if you don't have the luxury of time, you're doing comedy in a tragedy, it's very unnerving. And you see people could have lost a comrade that day. And we did one show where the next day a guy who was in the audience died while we were leaving the country. So uh, the comedy is heightened in a very peculiar way. The jokes penetrate the body armor it's a very gratifying audience. You ask about the audience. They're much more sophisticated, the soldiers, than you would see in a movie, in a war movie. They're, 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 they're computer scientists. They're engineers. You know, this is a very forward-thinking community. Men and women, every race and ethnicity. Um, I did a Rosh Hashanah show in Saddam's birthday palace in Tikrit. <laughs> yeah, I shit you not. Very difficult to get a decent bagel in Tikrit. And I stumbled upon a group of about a dozen Jewish soldiers who were meeting there for Rosh Hashanah. It was, it was uh, I don't know how to describe it. It was a, a life-changing moment for me. And uh, uh, since then, I've gone back uh, numerous times to all sorts of war zones and places. And it's, they're the greatest crowds. It's a little bit selfish and a little bit... Uh, sense of duty, but for the most part, they're the greatest shows. You walk out with a certain swagger and you're killing from the first joke. And I once performed for some Marines in Al Assad, Iraq, in a little tiny dungeon, and it was just amazing. It was probably the best show I ever had, it was, you know, 90 miles from the Syrian border. <laughs> That's wonderful. And, uh, and I just wanted to say something about Larry because we, we, we all took it a little uh, a little tough. He had, he created Mash based on his experiences in in Korea with uh, with Bob Hope, and and that was my favorite show growing up. And I had hundreds of emails where I'd write to him and I'd literally write, "Dear Dad," like Hawkeye would write to his own father. And um, he was such an unassuming guy. I mean, he's amazingly talented. I was having breakfast with him once in uh, in Los Angeles. And he ordered this beautiful egg white omelet, and it comes out, and this woman's at the next table and kibitzing, commenting on the omelet. So he cuts this big piece and puts it on her plate, and she won't stop chatting about it. And I wanted to say something like, lady, you're boxing with Muhammad Ali. And then she leaves, and I told him that I wanted to warn her off, and he said, don't worry, Eddie. It's a small town. Everybody knows everybody. She's going to go home and call all her friends and say, guess who I just had breakfast next to? Neil Simon. <laughs> and that's... that's <laughs> That's who he was, and I just wanted to, I'm, I'm, I'm so sorry that he's gone, but I'm happy that we have the opportunity to pay tribute to him, and, and I want to use his words, which I often do. He said this to Milton Berle. He said, thank you for letting a fan become a friend, and thank you for leading the way. Um, we're going to open the floor up for questions, and um, the first question... We're, when this Buddy Hackett, sorry, when Buddy Hackett passed away, I was asked to give a eulogy, and I was very nervous, mm -hmm. and I wrote it. I worked all night. And in the morning, on the way to the uh, funeral, I called Larry Gelbart, and I read it to him. And he said, don't change a word, which made me, gave me just the confidence that I needed because I was very upset. So yeah, it was a beautiful thank you, eulogy. Larry Gelbart. Thank you, Larry Gelbart. So this program is also on Twitter, um, for those of you who are internet savvy. And the first question uh, for Jeffrey Ross is, who living or dead? So the people who did not cough up money to come get to ask a question? But these people who... Brave the, the elements. Yeah, the 80 degree weather, yeah. And who, Some of these people could have been a Pinkberry tonight. <laughs> <laughs> know your audience. Okay. Um, uh, and, uh, the question uh, uh, for you is who living or dead would you most like to roast or have roasted? Living and dead, right there. <laughs> <laughs> 
He's looking for a quiet place to pass away right now. <laughs> be careful, sir. Be careful. <laughs> Uh, the uh, Crypt Keeper's fluffer over there. <laughs> <laughs> Why are the lights on? It's 120 degrees in here. Uh, oh, they're going to ask a question? Well, try him. This is a hip crowd. Look at this crowd. This is very hip. Got blonde Jews here. So cool. <laughs> <laughs> Who, living or dead, would you most like to roast or have roasted while they were alive? Uh, what? <laughs> Who, living or dead, would you most like to roast or have roasted while they were still alive? It's not a trick question. Can you phrase it in a simpler way? I, okay. Very confusing. Who, living or dead, would you most like to you just, have roasted? Who would I like to roast? Yeah. Try that one. Uh, you'd be a great roast. Thank you. I don't know. Well, you know... Obviously, you want to go for the big targets. Uh, obviously, the President of the United States would be a phenomenal, phenomenal roast. I think that would be a... You can make fun of his giant stimulus package. <laughs> I heard the President's schmeckle is so big that uh, Michelle calls it Air Force Two. <laughs> All right, we have a couple more questions before his tax audit begins. Mm -hmm. Yes, back there. I was wondering It's a great question, and this is a big one in the book because there was a lesson learned. Um, the roast must go on was the attitude that I took. I was a, produ a co-producer on that show. It was 9-11 uh, was on a Tuesday, we all remember, and uh, we were set to roast Hugh Hefner in a couple of weeks. And because there's so much equipment and personnel involved, we had to decide by the weekend to order these trucks and reserve and make sure, you know, it's a huge production. So we, were, we had to make a determination. And, this is before the cliche, you know, if you don't do the show, the terrorists win, like no one had, you know, this was the first thing, and I don't know, I was very conflicted about it, because obviously the roast was gonna be the last weekend of September, and then I think about it, and Hugh Hefner, I mean, this is, this is the guy you're gonna roast, I mean, this is why they hate us. This is the guy who uh, publishes Playboy magazine, it's, you know, you have to do it. I mean, if we don't do it, it's you know, well, let's just restructure it. It'll have a little bit of a, a mission. We, uh, we raised $600,000 for the uh, Twin Tower Fund. I wrote a letter to the Friars and uh, uh, Hugh Hefner and to Comedy Central, and I explained them that we had to do a show. Let's just not have an after party. We'll just take all the money that we're going to make, and we'll make a huge donation, and we'll do it for the right reasons, and it'll be memorable. It'll be awesome. And Maybe in three weeks, people will like a little laugh, and if they don't, well, you know, we tried. And it happened, you know. Uh, we all put tuxedos on. I said, uh, Hugh Hefner, you know why Hugh, Hugh Hefner has seven girlfriends? One to put it in, and the other six to move them around. <laughs> it was probably the most vulgar roast ever, and uh, Hugh Hefner was a great sport. He brought his seven blonde girlfriends, and. Um, uh, Artie Lang had my favorite joke. He said, uh, he said, uh, I smell pussy. Hef, did you burp? <laughs> you also said he has seven girlfriends because eight would be ostentatious. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it was very, it was really fun. You know, Hef was obviously a great sport and a great candidate for a roast. Rob Schneider, um, it was an amazing dais. Everybody, Stephen Colbert and, and, uh, and uh, Rob Schneider did a few jokes, and then a joke a couple didn't work, and I, I was producing. I was very nervous that maybe the show would take a turn for the worse, and I ran up to the podium, and I put my arm around um, Rob Schneider, and I said, Rob, hasn't there been enough bombing in this city? <laughs> Mickey Freeman is here. Mickey, how you doing, buddy? From the Sergeant Bilko Show. Great to see you. 
Mickey, stand up. <laughs> Thank you, buddy. Great to see you. <laughs> Back there. Yes, sir. He's referring to the, the, uh, a roast we did of uh, football legend Emmett Smith. Uh, Shaquille O'Neal was the uh, producer of the event. It was held in honor of a children's charity that Shaq uh, does a lot of stuff for. So Shaq asked me to come to Las Vegas, and um, it was intimidating. It was athletes who don't always have a sense of humor, and I was the only white person on the dais. And I said, this isn't a roast, it's a barbecue. And Shaq, to his credit, is pounding the table, <laughs> laughing at every single joke. And, and every joke that I did, uh, you know, uh, Jamie Foxx, who was a buddy of mine, he was the MC of the show. He, on, on the punchlines, if you saw, he would kick or punch into the air and accent my punchlines. He really gave me a lot of sort of extra uh, oomph. And uh, I said, Shaq, your knuckles look scraped. Did you walk here? It was a very, very provocative roast. And um, at one point, uh, a newer guy named Doug, uh, Wi Doug Williams went on, and his jokes weren't working. And the bar was high, and this was a tough crowd. And you know he was uh, not hitting. And the job of a roast master, of an MC of a roast, is to keep the show moving, keep it alive, keep it fun make it a party. And this guy, this guy, Doug Williams, his jokes were becoming mean-spirited, and he wasn't prepared, and he wouldn't get off. So Jamie Foxx, who was the roast master, stood on the edge and started becoming this comedian's live conscience. This is your conscience speaking. Time to wrap it up. <laughs> and the guy just kept going and going and going, and Jamie just said, another one that didn't work. I better say something nice and get the hell off. <laughs> and the guy just kept going and going and going until it became this sort of, I don't know, it was, uh, it was something out of a vaudeville routine. <laughs> and you know, uh, the lesson is that you know, a roast master needs to sort of take control of the show, even if somebody's gonna get their feelings hurt. So uh, it was interesting. Uh, Jamie Foxx, very, very funny guy. Yes, sir. Okay. That was over the line. Yeah. Um, you saw it before, we were roasting Courtney Love, and um, she had gone into the bathroom during the commercial break with Andy Dick, which I repeat is never, ever a good idea. <laughs> and uh, if you don't know Andy Dick, he's, he's disgusting, and uh, he's a crazy man, and his, uh, the joke I said about him once was that his sole mission in life was to give AIDS back to the monkeys. He sleeps with men, women, animals, he doesn't care. And Courtney Love came out of the bathroom a screaming mess. And uh, there's plenty of footage and f photos online. I have a few in the book, you'll see. She's lifted her shirt up and humping the red, le you know, the armrest of the couch, and she's disrupting everybody. And Sarah Silverman went on to perform, and Jimmy Kimmel had to physically hold Courtney Love down so that Sarah could do her roast. And I'm waiting to go on, and I'm sweating, and I'm going, this crazy maniac is going to upstage me, and I worked weeks on my jokes, and I started writing in the margin, like showstoppers, jokes that would just shut her up. <laughs> and, I'm, uh, and, and I had one um, in my margin, and, uh, and the joke you refer to, and the joke we saw, and I showed it to Jimmy Kimmel, who was the roast master, at the commercial break, and he said, you cannot do that joke. <laughs> That's over the line. And uh, I said, you're probably right. And everything I tried with Courtney Love, she just, you know, she's throwing ice at me. She's trying to grab my notes. You know, I did the joke about, you know, the girl next door, if you happen to live next to a methadone clinic, and nothing would stop her. And it's a benefit for PETA, so you'd think somebody would have a stun gun or something, but... <laughs> 
finally I just said, screw it, and I did it. I said, how is it possible that Courtney Love looks worse than Kurt Cobain? Which was her husband that shot his brains out like nine years before that. And there was a moment of shock in the room. I don't know if you can imagine what the sound of a thousand jaws dropping sounds like, <laughs> but I know that sound, and it's sort of like a, uh, I don't know, a black hole of its own happened, and you saw it in Courtney Love's face, and there was a moment of sobriety. <laughs> and she checked herself into rehab the next day, and roasting saves lives. We have time for one more question. Yes, sir. Oh, you know what? He was on the Joan Rivers roast. He made a video, and he was completely, he was completely hilarious. And uh, he's been very generous to the uh, next generation, or the, however you want to explain it. He's just, uh, you know, there's a certain reverence, but he's not into it. He likes to just be one of the boys. And uh, he, uh, one quick story. I was at Milton Berle's funeral, and uh, the whole memorial service ended and everybody went down to the grave um, and I really had to use the men's room as most of you probably do right now and uh, I knew that this particular chapel in Beverly Hills had like a family room so I waited till everybody left and I knew that this little spot because I had been there for Buddy Hackett's funeral I said I know there's a secret family bathroom in the back of this place so everybody clears out it's very sad but i have this one thing on my mind i really just have to do this before i go out to the cemetery and i find this little corner bathroom uh and uh i close the door i'm in there 45 seconds i do my thing i wash my hands i check my teeth whatever i open the door don rickles is standing there with his hands on his hips like he's been waiting for two hours <laughs> And I opened the door, and I said, Don! And he looks at me, and he looks me up, and then he goes, what, was there a dais in there? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> the king, Don Rickles. Don Rickles. I only roast the ones I love. Jeffrey will be signing autographs outside. Eddie, and it's thank available you, on Amazon and in New Jersey. Jeffrey Ross, thank you. Thanks a lot for coming. Thanks for coming.